economics. And as we've said all along, the point of these lectures is to help you give you some background information that often shows up in rounds. And economics is one of the most important lessons, uh, but it's also one that is probably the most un uh, misunderstood by several people in congressional rounds. Some people will just quote sources and pretend that that's the only truth in economics. And the simple fact is that that's not the case. Okay, so having a little bit of the knowledge and background information about how our economy works is very important for Congress. After all, you, know, you are enacting policies that can have severe effects upon the U.S. economy. So you really need to understand how the economy works so that we can understand how you guys don't really want to mess it up by passing certain bills or resolutions. Okay, so the first thing to do is to define what we mean by economics. Okay, anybody have a guess? Yes. The economy and how, like, I mean, talking about long-term trends and businesses and corporations, the private sector. Okay. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Nothing? The effects of supply and demand on the way that our society runs. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. The science of scarce resources. Right. So most people define economics as how people in our system, businesses, corporations, independent people, the government, and individuals, right, households, how we use scarce resources, right? So in economics, scarcity is the big, big principle, right? If we didn't have scarcity, we wouldn't need economics, right? There would be no reason to be efficient with what we did because we'd have an unlimited supply of things. We could just do whatever we want. But as we all know, that's not how it works, right? So we can talk about the economy of several things. You'll hear us talk about word economy, right? It's all about being efficient. You have a three-minute speech. There's only so many words you can use, right? So you have to, you have a scarcity of time, and you have to adjust yourself accordingly. The same is true in the economy, right? We have, an, we have a limited supply of resources. We have a limited supply of money. And as a result, the people in the economy have to figure out what to do with it, okay? And how to use those resources in the most efficient way possible. So economics is all about the scarcity of resources and how individuals, how governments, and how businesses learn to interact and use those resources to produce the most effective society possible. Okay? So one of the central aspects of economics is that everything is really related. Okay? So this is called the cyclical flow model. All right? And I'll explain it after I write it. But once you master this, I can guarantee you that anything, buying, selling, whatever we do, is covered by this model. Okay, so it's really important uh, to know. Okay, so this, again, okay, the idea of the cyclical flow model is that everything in our economy is interrelated, right? So you can't change one thing without causing some other change in the system. So the, the two big, as we've already talked about, the households, which are individuals, right, and businesses, okay? You also have government in the mix. All right, the other two things up here are the product market, right, so goods and services, like if I want a pack of Oreos, right, that's a product, the MISCO makes that, okay, I'd have to buy it, and the resource market, right, so what do, what do you think we mean by resources? Yeah, love it. What's available to the average consumer or what's available to be made into goods? Okay, right. That's, that's the key thing, right? Things that we use to make other goods. Okay, so this includes, for example, labor, right? Our work. All right, it also includes natural resources, right? So, you know, water, oil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So all of these things are related. All right, and you can start to see how. Okay, households, how are they related to the government? What, what do individuals do with the government? Yeah. Well, we households contain people who vote for electives in the government. Okay, but I'm talking about economically. Yes. Okay, so households give the government taxes, right? Okay, what does the government give households or individuals in return? Subsidization in some cases. In, like what? Well, like, uh, I mean, if like some of these really poor, then the federal government will give them uh, grants or uh, some other form of assistance that will allow them to survive. Right, so in economic language, we call these transfers, right? So they're, 
the government gives you these things like Social Security, Medicare, right? So all of these things are, are government transfers back to households. Okay, so what do businesses give to the government? Somebody else, yeah? Uh, they give them tax and right. importation stuff. Okay, and then in return, what, is, what does government give businesses? Yeah? Protection? In terms of what? Yeah, you're right. What kind of protection? Legal. Yeah, right. So the government decides, look, you can operate. Uh, in many cases, especially if you talk about small city governments, they also give them like tax breaks uh, to help them thrive, right? So we're talking about subsidies here, right? Okay. Uh, so these are, this is really the most important part of the model, right? These are also important, uh, but essentially, <coughs> right? Government uses resources, right? Government buys products, okay? Those are pretty easy to explain, okay? So the real interaction here is between households, businesses, and the government. And it's really important for you guys because, as again, you guys are representing the U.S. government, so you really need to know how you interact. And as you can tell, taxes are really important, okay? That's why when we talk about all these things that that are you know, pieces of bills, right? So we're gonna increase taxes on this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna spend money on this. All these things are very important pieces of this model. But like I said, everything that the government does, everything that you guys will do in some way or another is covered by this model, okay? Okay, so what is the, someone wanna take a guess at what the interaction is between households and products? Right, okay. Okay, and then, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so we're talking about, you know, the buying of merchandise. What about households and the resource market? Now remember what the resource market is. John? Well, people in households have jobs, and those jobs create, or manufacturing or you know creating resources. Right, so when we're talking about households and, and the resource market, we're talking about the supply of labor, right? People go out and get jobs. So they are contributing in the economy through their labor. Okay, on this side, how do businesses interact with products? Selling. selling. Yeah, there you go, okay, right? So we're talking about the selling merchandise, right? What about businesses in the resource market? Somebody beside, yes? They use the resources to make the product. Right, so this is, okay. So the resources are used in production, right? So if we didn't have labor, if we didn't have oil, if we didn't have water, a lot of products couldn't be made, right? So businesses have to use these resources to produce the products that are then sold in the product market and that then go to households or purchased by the government. Okay, so everything in the economy is interrelated, guys. And that's really the most important piece of this model. So whatever you talk about, if you're talking about a government policy, you're gonna end up in, uh, impacting some of these people, right? So if you're talking about giving a tax break, you're talking about the government giving a subsidy to businesses, okay? Now, if the government, if businesses can run their business for cheaper, what does that mean? Right, so they can, they can put more products in the product market. Okay, more products in the product market mean that households and the government have a greater selection, right? They can buy more things because there are more things being sold. Okay, so all of these things are really interrelated. Okay. Any questions about the cyclical flow, um, John? Can you also add tariffs onto government and businesses? Yeah, yeah. so essentially you would just be, it would be the option of a subsidy, right? Uh, Except, if, it depends on what kind of tariff you're talking about. If you're talking about a protective tariff, protective. okay, that's almost the same thing as a subsidy, because if you're imposing a cost on an outside business, like a foreign business, you're subsidizing the domestic business. So it's essentially the same thing. You could also be talking about tariffs on certain types of corporations in the U.S., and that would be the opposite of a subsidy, right? You're making it harder for that business to operate. Any other questions about the security? <coughs> So now what I want to do is talk about some terms that are often thrown about in Congress and everybody's like, I really have no idea what that means. But now you will. Okay, the first 
is GDP. Okay, somebody want to define it? Yes. Gross domestic product. Okay, absolutely. Gross domestic product. Okay, what do we think we mean by gross domestic product? Yeah. The average that each household income is of like the GDP. national. Okay, somebody else? It's the amount of money that the government makes after you factor in all the expenses like, um, with subsidies. And okay, um, so, the, so the, the actual definition uh, is that it's the total value of all goods and services produced in an economy within a given year. Okay, so that's, that's the dictionary definition. You guys will never have to define that in a round, but you do need to know what GDP is a measure of, right? And so when we talk about GDPs and GDPs being higher in the U.S. than, say, I don't know, Canada, right? We're talking about the health of the economy. So we measure the health of the economy through GDP. Now, there are four big pieces of gross domestic product. The first is consumption, right? So again, this, in this model, is households and the government, essentially, but more households, right? We're talking about individuals purchasing products, they are consuming the products that businesses put into the market. Okay, so when you're, talk, when you're trying to measure GDP, the first real ingredient, if you will, is the consumption, right? So the total value of goods consumed in the United States. The second piece of GDP is government spending. As we all know, or as we should know, the government spends a lot of money. Okay? Uh, this spending goes directly into calculations of gross domestic product. All right, so as the government spends more, what happens to GDP and everything else being held constant? Yeah? It goes down. Because if the government spends... No, it goes, no, it goes up. It goes up. Right? So when you're calculating this, you, it's like the total value of all of these things. So if one of these pieces goes up, everything else goes up. Right? The total, this whole thing goes up. Yes. So we're not reducing anything, so then why is it going up? Well, we're again, other countries stuff. think about, okay, but we're still spending money. We're putting money into the economy, okay? By spending whatever we're spending it on, right? If we're spending it on, I don't know, Nabisco's Oreos, right? The government says we need 300 packages from Nabisco's Oreos. That is money that's being put into the economy. So again, it's helping contribute to the health of the economy. That's why all of these pieces, if they go up, GDP will go up. They go down, GDP will go down. Yes. So only domestic, or does that also include global spending? Only domestic. Okay. All right. Consumption, government spending. The next is investment. Okay, we're talking about investment in businesses, investment in people, uh, government investment, investment in general, right? And then the final piece, which goes back to what you were saying, is net exports. Okay, so you'll sometimes see this abbreviated X sub N. And you won't even know that it's X sub N, except if somebody's like X sub N. Okay. Like calm down. Okay, <laughs> so net exports are exports minus imports, right? So if Let's say exports, let's just keep it simple. Exports are 100, imports are 90. Net exports would be? 10. 10, right, and it would be a positive or negative? Positive. positive. So that make GDP go up or GDP go down? Uh, up, right, okay. Now, what about the reverse situation? Right, if we export less than we import, what happens? It's a negative and? It goes down, right? Okay, so this is really important because from this, okay, we get the trade deficit, right? Does the United States operate trade deficit or, okay, hold on. Let's talk about what a deficit surplus are first. So a deficit is a situation like here, right, where you have a negative number, where imports exceed exports. Okay, surplus would be the opposite, right, where exports are greater than imports. The United States, for a long time, 
it exported less than it imports, right? We all know that you will see countless legislation each year about the trade deficit with China and how problematic that is for us, okay? Well, the reason it's problematic is because if, if that results in a negative number, what are we doing to our gross domestic product? Lowering it. Right. So all things considered, we're actually harming our economy. At least that's how the argument goes. Unless some of these other pieces together offset that. Any questions about that? Yes. So trade deficit is caused by a negative, uh, greater import than export? Yes. So we import more than we export. So that would be a trade deficit. A trade surplus would be we export more than we import. Yeah. And yeah. There is the trade deficit uh, on a country by country basis, or is it overall? Yeah. So, for example, what you can you can find uh, like international organizations will publish gross domestic product figures for all countries, and so when they calculate it, it'll be like gross domestic product for the United States equals you know U.S. exports mm -hmm. minus U.S. imports, okay. and you'll see that the imports are, are larger, and you'll be able to tell uh, some because of the European Union. They've had to kind of redo their statistics, so you'll also see like an aggregate EU figure in some international uh, publications. So that's kind of cool to look at too. Any other questions? No. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's gross domestic product. Another thing you'll hear thrown about is they just get rid of the the D. And I two gross national product. Okay. So does anybody want to take a, a guess at what the difference is? Yes. Domestic is only what's inside the country. Okay. National is what is outside overseas corporations. Okay, excellent. Right, so gross domestic product are things produced within the United States. All right, now, gross domestic product can also include foreign businesses operating in the U.S., right? Because it's still in the U.S. Gross national product says, okay, we're going to take away all foreign, okay, like resources contributed by foreign corporations. And we're going to add U.S. corporations operating abroad, right? So the national is important, right? Like U.S. nationals. So gross national product, you won't see it used as much. Uh, and the reason is because, you know, most people are concerned about what's going on within a given country. They don't really care about U.S. corporations abroad uh, because, again, a lot of these, if the corporation is operating abroad, they don't necessarily do as much as a, a U.S. corporation would do, right? You're not going to really be buying as many of the U.S. resources because you're operating in a different country, right? You can't employ somebody, in most cases, from Texas if you're operating most of your resources in India, right? It's a little hard to employ them from like half a world away, okay? So that's why gross national product is not used as much, so GDP is the one you'll need to know. But some people and some statistics that you'll find will say GNP, and it's fine to use that, all right? It's still a measure of the uh, economic strength, but just know that there are differences. Okay. Let's talk. All right, so. I mean, the most important graph you'll ever see in economics, okay? It's seriously, it's like the basis of everything in economics. Okay, uh, first what we need to talk about is let's say, let's give you an example, an eco. You are an employee, okay? And you make a certain wage, cool, all right. Now let's say you make $1,000 a year, okay? So you have a not so great job. Nice. Sorry, okay. So let's let's say this is the market for I don't know Oreos just because we've been talking about cookies it makes me really hungry for cookies. Okay, Oreos, right? So <clears throat> as the price of Oreos increases, given your income, you're gonna buy more or less Oreos. Why? Because they cost Right, right. You don't have as much money. You're like, well, okay, I need Oreos. Yeah, cool. I also need like soap, clothes, <laughs> right? Things that are gonna help me. Survive. Okay, so what we talk about in economics is your demand for Oreos, your demand for a given thing. Okay, so this is the demand, right? And you can see as the price goes up, right? Let's let's consider two points. Okay, 
This point represents what, Anika? Like how, how expensive is the product? It's pretty expensive, right? And how many you have? Few, right? All right. Now let's say the product, the price goes down. Okay. Right. Lower price. How many more? You, how many of you gonna buy? A lot. Right. Okay. So you can see that this is your demand, right? As the price goes up, you can't afford to buy as much. All right. So you're gonna have to make some calculations. Okay. Now let's see. Uh, John, yes. you are the Nabisco Corporation. Congratulations. Thank you. You sell Oreos and they're delicious. Great. Okay. <clears throat> as the price goes up. As the price you can get for each package of Oreos goes up, are you going to sell more or are you going to sell less? Well, it's going to increase the cost of Oreos, so I'm not going to be able to produce as much, so I won't be able to sell as much. Okay, think, think about you as a corporation. Yes. What is your ultimate goal? To make money. To make money. So if you can get more for your product, are you going to sell more or are you going to sell less? Well, I'm going to, if I can, I'll sell more. Yeah, but that's exactly it. You're going to sell more, right? Yes. So as a corporation, as the price of the product goes up, you're going to sell more, right? If somebody told me, hey, I could work two extra hours a week and make about $10,000 more, I'd work two extra hours a week, okay? So this is the supply, right? As you can see, as the price goes up, a corporation will sell more of a given product. Now this is the important point, right? This is the equilibrium point. It's the price where Anika's ability to buy Oreos equals John's willingness to sell Oreos at that price. Right? So it would be a certain price, let's say, I don't know, $1.50, and then like I don't know, 100 things of Oreos. It's a lot of cookies. You should cut back with cookies. <laughs> okay. So equilibrium in the market is very important. And when we talk about basically any economic relationship, you're going to be referring to supply and demand. So you need to understand how supply and demand work, okay? which direction they go. You also need to understand who is doing the demand and the supply of the thing. Right? So it could be a supply, it could be a corporation selling its product. It could be you right? selling your labor. Okay? As you can get more, you're going to probably want to work more. Right? And then again, so supply and demand, know the directions, and really e anything in economics can be related to, and most of it flows from this simple model. Okay? So supply and demand is like the crux of economics. Any questions? Yes? So what is the Q on the graph? It's quantity. So like the quantity that's ultimately purchased. Okay? And this is, the, of course, the price. Any other questions? Okay. So supply and demand is critical. <coughs> And when you hear people talk about supply or demand, you need to kind of understand what they're talking about. And now you'll understand the relationship between the two. All right? Okay. Now what I want to do is to kind of get into some other terms that are kind of thrown about. All right, the first is inflation. Okay. Inflation is defined as an increase in the price level. Okay, now this does not mean that if Oreos go from $1.50 to $2 in a day, that we're experiencing inflation, right? It doesn't mean that. What it means is that on an aggregate level, right, if you consider Oreos, you consider gas, you consider food, right, you consider everything, if you have a general increase in the price level, then we're undergoing inflation. Right, so we're talking about a general increase or an average increase. What they actually do when they compute these is they take what they refer to as a basket of goods, right, so it doesn't mean that, oh my gosh, milk is like $2 more today, the cows must have become more expensive. <laughs> It means let's look at milk and three, four, or five other things and determine if a basket, like a grocery basket of goods, today, if I can get the same product for a lower price or a higher price, right? If it costs me $5 more to get the entire basket of goods, then we have inflation, right? Over a given year, okay? So inflation is really important, uh, but it's also often misunderstood, okay? 
Now, there are two real big causes of inflation. The first is caused by the prices. This is kind of what John was talking about a second ago. Right? The prices of the resources that we're using to make the products, if that goes up, okay, so like price, if the price of resources increases, right, so today, I don't know, it may cost me five dollars a gallon of water to make something that requires water. I don't know. And then two years from now, it cost me twenty dollars to for the same gallon of water, right? We've had a general increase in the price level if, you know, like I said, the basket of goods has increased. Because the price of the resources has now gone up. Okay? This <coughs> is known as cost push inflation. Okay? You can kind of see how it goes. If cost goes up, we're basically pushing inflation higher. Okay, that's the reason for inflation. That's one of the reasons, right? The price of resources has gone up. So when you're talking about legislation which can make things more expensive, which can make resources more expensive, you could be dealing with a situation where you argue that inflation is going to increase because the price of resources is now going to increase because of some government policy that you're debating. Okay? The other, and the one you hear more about, at least in the United States, is called demand pull, right? So it's like, all right, if we have, I don't know, too many people asking for too few goods, right? So it's, it's really, Okay. This is demand, right? So if we say, look, there, the demand far exceeds what corporations, what the government is able to supply, then you're dealing with a case where the prices of it could increase, right? Because the demand is just crazy. Any questions about the types of inflation? Yeah? Well, you always hear about inflation as a bad thing, but if the prices are being raised, then that does not mean corporations are making more money that they can put back into the economy. Right. So, okay, inflation, you're, you're, you're right. Inflation doesn't have to be necessarily a bad thing. The reason why we call it a bad thing is because all too often the prices of uh, products will increase, but the prices of, say, wages <coughs> won't increase at the same amount, right? So if the prices of a product go up, and I'm not making more, I'm making the same amount of money, that's really bad for me because I can't produce, or I can't buy as much, right? You see what I'm saying? Uh, so if, if inflation was followed by an increase in wages to, a, to the same level, it would be fine, right? Like if milk cost a dollar a day and I made a dollar a day, I'd say, hey, I can buy a thing of milk, right? But if milk goes up to $2 and I'm still making a dollar, I'm not going to be drinking milk, right? I'm going to be drinking some water. <laughs> but if you know, milk goes up to $2 and my wage goes up to $2, I'm still fine. You see what I'm saying? So it depends on other things in the economy. But in general, the wages don't go up as quickly, which is why inflation is a bad thing. Love it? Can deflation be a bad thing? Deflation can occur, uh, and you don't hear about it a lot because, let's be honest, inflation has been our uh, right. plague. All right. Uh, but deflation, it really, deflation can be. Okay, this is just kind of the opposite, right? It's like a decrease in the price level. <coughs> okay. Uh, what, you, what you really want with these things is you don't want things changing too quickly, right? So if the price level changes rapidly, right? So we have inflation very high as we did in the 80s. You really, that's really a bad thing, right? If prices fall really quickly, that can also be a bad thing, right? So you really want small, subtle changes and you'd really like everything to kind of keep up with inflation. Right, that's why in like federal programs you'll see, uh, they'll say, you know, indexed for inflation, right? So indexed for how much we could buy today versus how much we could buy three years ago. Okay, because they try and keep up to allow people to purchase the same amount of goods that they could, you know, a couple years ago. Make sense? Okay. So when you, understand, when you talk about inflation and you want to talk about it in a round, it's really nice to be able to say, okay, here's the cause of the inflation. Right? When we talk about elevating the argument, it's about adding this layer of specificity. Because anybody can say inflation is going to increase. 
But if you can say, here's why inflation is increasing, and here's why this bill or this resolution causes this kind of inflation, you're instantly going to set yourself apart from the other people. Okay, so understand that inflation can be caused by a number of factors, right? It's not just this big mega term that has no meaning, okay? Any questions? Okay. All right, uh, the next real thing we want to talk about okay, is the difference between fiscal policy and monetary policy. Okay. As you know, or as I hope you know, you guys represent U.S. Congress people. Because of that, you guys are very involved in fiscal policy. Okay, now fiscal policy. levels of taxes and levels of spending, right? So it's all concerned about what Congress is doing to change the fiscal policy. If Congress increases taxes, right, or Congress increases or decreases spending on a given program, that is all part of fiscal policy, okay? Monetary policy is a little bit different, right? And it's, in the United States, controlled by the Federal Reserve. Okay. The reason for this, and it was a brilliant thing in my opinion to do so, is because we really don't want Congress doing everything with our economy. The reason why is because oftentimes Congress gets it wrong. Okay. Congress does not, many Congress people, do not have degrees in economics. They don't have the uh, mathematical training to operate you know, complex equations with our economy. Right? So you really don't want them doing it. Just imagine, like Harry Reid, or John McCain trying to figure out what we should do. <laughs> and you'll understand the scope of the problem. Okay? And it goes, it goes to both sides of the point, right? We just don't want our politicians being able to control everything with our economy. And the reason why is because if these Congress people are being elected, they might try and strategically manipulate our economy to ensure that they get reelected, right? And that doesn't help average Joe, right? Or average Kevin in this case. Okay? So I really don't want my Congress people doing everything with their economy. And so that's why we put monetary policy with the Federal Reserve. Okay, monetary policy, it should be obvious, is concerned with the money supply. Okay, so how much money is flowing through the U.S. economy? Okay, so what the Federal Reserve does, and we'll talk about specifics in just a second, is they have tools to change how money is flowing through the economy. And the way they do that can often help us in, uh, in times when our economy is not doing so hot. Okay? All right, fiscal policy is pretty easy to explain. Like I said, it relates to taxes and spending. Monetary policy we need to kind of spend a little bit more time on because it will help you not only in Congress, but if, for those of you who do extend and who need to understand how the economy works. Uh, monetary policy is really something that you kind of have to have a little bit more of a better understanding. Okay. So, the first thing to talk about here is the difference between the debt and the deficit, and to talk about what we mean by the recession. Okay. If Congress, in its infinite wisdom, decides to spend more than it takes in in taxes, we have a deficit, right? Okay, so this is Congress spends more than it takes in taxes, okay? That happens often. Right? Congress is like, yeah, let's just spend all the money, all the money, okay? And so we, we often run a deficit, right? We're talking about a year-to-year -year measure, right? <clears throat> if, as we've done a couple of times, 
Congress actually, you know, remembers what its job is and is smart, we can often run a surplus, right? Which is the exact opposite of this, right? Where we spend less than what we take in taxes. That's a good thing, okay? But it doesn't happen often, okay? So these are both year-to-year -year calculations, right? So in 2013, actually it's a fiscal year of 2013, did we spend more than what we took in in federal income taxes, okay? If we spent more than we took in in taxes, we have a deficit. If we didn't, we have a surplus, okay? The debt is the long-term value of the deficits, and the surpluses, right? So if, for example, let's just say we're calculating the debt for, you know, the past three years, which, I mean, obviously we have a running total for, like, some years and years and years. Okay, so let's say three years ago we had a $10 million deficit, the next year we had a $20 million, and this year we had a $30 million. Okay, what would be the debt? $60 million. Right, so, we're talking about an accumulated value of the debts, of the deficits and the surpluses. That's what the debt is. Okay, so when you're talking about economic terms, don't use debt if you mean deficit. If you're talking about long term, don't say deficit, okay? Because that's not what you mean. What you mean is the national debt. Okay, there are, way, there are resources you can use to find this, like there's a national debt calculator, which is pretty cool. Uh, it also shows how much per capita debt is, so it's really like, last time we checked it was like 20, 24,000 a person in the United States. So like everybody pay $24,000 to the government and we would solve our debt, right? That's not gonna happen. But it tells you how big our problem is. Okay, we have a huge debt problem. Any questions about debt, debt. Okay. Please do not mix them up. I cannot tell you how many people in Congress will mix these up. Okay, this should never be you for this lecture. Okay. Uh, the recession, okay, if we, if we talk about a recession, now different people will define it in different ways, but essentially what it means <clears throat> and how the government agencies in charge of determining when we start a recession do it is it's a period, right, over several months. Okay, so it's a period of economic decline, right? So most of the people do it in quarters, okay, so like four months. Three months. Okay, uh, so the it's a period of decline, and it would be a period of decline in GDP. Okay, so if GDP goes down in two consecutive periods, okay, we start to discuss a recession. All right, very important in the world of Congress, world of extent, to know what recession is, and to know how it affects us. Right, recession is not a good thing in economics. We don't like them. All right, but we know that they happen. All right, so all of this is related to monetary policy. Now, who controls monetary policy in the United States? Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve. Okay, so let's talk. Now that we understand some of these broad terms of monetary policy, let's talk about tools that the Federal Reserve can use to move us into, hopefully, uh, times of economic prosperity and out of recession. Okay, because these tools really work together. All right, so knowing what con Congress is pretty simple, right? If we are in a recession and Congress is like, look, let's spend more money to get out of it, it's pretty easy to see what their fiscal policy would be, right? Let's spend more money. Okay. The Federal Reserve is a little bit different because they can't do uh, what Congress can do. They can't raise taxes on people, right? But they can do a lot of other things. Okay. Now, I'm going to write these and then I will explain what they are. about GDP, we said that it's a measure of economic health, right? If there's more money in the economy, 
the GDP is going to be doing a lot better than if there's less. So one of the things that we can try and do in times of a recession okay, is to increase the amount of money in the economy, right? So for example, in our most recent recession, the thought was, look, people are out of work, they don't have money, they can't do a lot of things, all right? If we increase the money in the economy, we can do a lot of things. First of all, if households acquire that money, they can do what with it? They can spend it, right? They can go out and buy products. The buying of the products makes corporations be able to hire more people, right? It makes a lot of other things happen, okay? So that's why we're talking about increasing money in the economy. If, on the other hand, we allow businesses to get more money, they can essentially do the same thing, right? They can hire more people. They can invest in opportunities, say, like, if a corporation wants to say, okay, let's open up a new branch in Texas, you have to have people to staff that branch, right? So they would hire more people. All right, so increasing money in times of recession is often what the government wants to do. Okay, so the Federal Reserve really kind of controls how much money is going to circulate in the economy. We do this through these three things. Open market operations, the discount rate, and the reserve requirement. Now, you guys probably won't deal with these two much, although if you're reading reports about what the Federal Reserve is doing, and you see these terms, I don't want you to be confused. I want you to know what this means and how it impacts the U.S. economy. Okay, so let's do these first. These are easier to get rid of. Okay, the discount rate. So the Federal Reserve, as part of its organization, um, for those banks who are federally insured, they have an account in the Federal Reserve. Okay. The discount rate allows banks within the United States to obtain money at a certain interest rate. Right. So if a bank needs, say, $5,000 to fund something, it doesn't have $5,000 on hand, it can ask another bank, either you know another bank close, or in, in many cases it can ask a, another bank, like a federal bank, for additional money, right? And so the Fed controls the discount rate. And the discount rate is the interest rate charged to that bank. So if I have to pay more in interest to borrow money, do you think I'm gonna borrow more money or less money? Less, right? Because I don't really wanna pay back as much interest. So if, the Federal Reserve wants to enable banks to loan out more money, to get more money to loan out, are they going to raise the discount rate or lower it? Lower it. Lower it, right? So you want, in times of recession, you want to lower it, right? Because this allows banks to say, okay, we can obtain more money, we can make more loans, and those loans, or that investment, or whatever the bank is going to do with the money, can go out and hopefully create more jobs, put more money in the economy, and therefore increase gross domestic product, right? And get us out of a recession. Okay, the reserve requirement is also pretty easy to explain. Okay, it's the amount, let me percentage, that banks have to keep on hand, right? So if they have a total, uh, like total assets of say 100 million, the Federal Reserve will require them to keep a certain percentage of that on hand, meaning they can't loan it out. Okay? And that's because, say, when we had the Great Depression and people said a run on banks, you know, you've heard the term run on banks? Yeah. That's because everyone went to the bank was like, I want my money! <laughs> okay, well, if they all do that at the same time, the banks have to be able to give some of this money back. All right, so the Federal Reserve requires banks to keep a certain percentage of its assets on hand in case these things happen. So, if we're trying to increase the amount of money in the economy, not in the banks, hold on, John, are we going to raise or lower the reserve requirement? Are we require banks to keep more or less of their money? Less, right? And why? They're still enough to give if they're So right, because if you if you're okay, let's say let's say it's a pie, like a pie. Okay. I'm like, how about food today? Okay, and this is the reserve requirement. They have all of this that they can loan out. Right, and if they loan it out, people can do things with it. Businesses, businesses can use it to open up new branches. They can hire more people. They can do things with this money. But if it was raised, and now you know banks had to keep this amount, it's really not going to do much, right? Because they can only give that out. Yes, Joe. With the reserve requirements, isn't that why banks are insured for the FDIC? 
Yes. Right? Because we don't want banks to be defaulting, right? We don't want everybody going to the bank saying, give me your money. And then people are like, oh, we don't have that money, right? <laughs> okay. So, you know, when you guys have a bank account and if you've got like $1,000 in the bank account, realize that it's not like they have this big storage room <laughs> and it's like Kevin Eaton's bank account. <laughs> they don't have $1,000 in there at all times, right? They're taking that money. They're loaning it to different purposes. Okay, now the assumption is that when you actually want to take money out of that account, they, the bank will have that money to give you, right? Because it is your money. But it's not like locked away in some secret dungeon, right? Where they can just suddenly give it to you when you want it. That's not how banking works in the United States. Okay? So the reserve requirement is another tool that the Federal Reserve can use to kind of send more money into the economy in times of recession. wearing out these pens. Okay. Any questions about the discount rate or the reserve requirement? Okay. Open market operations are actually really fun to talk about. Um, and they're really cool. So let's talk. What? Huh? What did you say? Open market operations? Open market. Now if you guys take finance, you'll go into a lot more of the specifics, but this is like Let's just learn how our basic economy works, okay? Because you need to really know about what the Federal Reserve is doing, uh, especially for events like Congress and extent. Okay, open market operations is concerned with the buying and selling of government bonds. Okay, now let's figure out what a bond is. It's a little piece of paper, right? And it's like, if you buy a government bond, you, you're going to get a certain percentage of interest back each year, and at the end of the bond, most of them are like 10-year bonds, right? They're going to give you what you pay. So if the bond costs $2,500, you're going to buy the bond for $2,500. The government promises to give you a certain percentage of interest each year over the 10 years that the bond is existing, and at the end of the time, right, you get that money back. And so that's how government is able to often finance operations, right? So it, organizations... Uh, municipalities do the same thing with bonds, okay? So it's basically like an IOU in the future, right? It's like, if you buy this now, promise to give you some money back <laughs> in the future, right? That's good because, like I said, banks don't always have what they need to do what they want. And as a result, they need to borrow it from people who do have what they need, okay? And bonds are the way to do this. All right, so I need two people. Okay, so Melanie and Logan. Melanie, you want to... You want to buy the bond or you want to sell the bond? I'll buy the bond. Okay, so Melanie is going to buy the bond. Buy the bank. So buy. Okay, and Logan, you're going to be selling. So Logan, you are now the Federal Reserve. Congratulations. Awesome. All right. Okay, so Logan, you are selling your bond. Here's your bond. Okay, so you sell the bond to Melanie. Do you get, what kind of money do you get? Money. What kind of money? Okay, so you give them a piece of paper. Yes. <coughs> and you, do you put money in the economy or take money out of the economy? Put money into the economy. Why? Why do you think? Because I'm giving her money to you. Well, you're giving her a piece of paper. Right. Oh. And you're taking her $2,500. Yeah, okay. That, that's so it, I'm yeah. Taking. Okay, so are you giving money to the economy? I'm taking. Right, okay. So if you're like, look, if, if we sell bonds, what happens is the bonds go out and money comes back into the Federal Reserve, right? Because it's just like you got, you right? If, if, a if a corporation sells Nabisco, the Nabiscos go out and the money comes back into the corporation. It works the same way for the government. If you sell a bond, the money comes back into the Federal Reserve. Do you really want money coming into the Federal Reserve or do you want money going out into the economy? Probably out. Yeah. If you're in a recession, you want money going out into the economy. Yeah. So. If we're in a recession, recession, is the government going, or is the Federal Reserve, going to sell bonds or buy bonds? Buy. Buy. And why? Because they want to put money back in the economy. Right. Because if, if the federal government buys a bond, the government's like, thank you for my bond. Back. Thanks. <laughs> and they're giving you $2,500, right? Or whatever it costs to sell, to buy the bond. Okay, so that puts that money back in the economy. So in times of recession, what are we doing? 
So right. <laughs> you there you know, give it our money. Get so it. buying bonds. So for example, the Federal Reserve just met in June, and they had to determine whether or not they were going to buy bonds or sell bonds. Okay. So we're still trying to recover from a recession. So what do you think we did? Buy bonds. Okay. All right. <laughs> Yay. Now we understand how the economy works. Okay. <laughs> This is true if we're talking about a recession. Now, if we have inflation, which again we talked about earlier, right? It's too much money chasing what? Too few goods. Okay, so we have too much money in the economy. <clears throat> so we need to pull it back. All right, so let, we need to get money out of the economy. What are we going to do with the discount rate? Low. Why are we going to make it higher? You're exactly right. Right, so if we, if we raise how much banks are going to have to you know, pay back in interest, right, the assumption is they're going to have less money to loan out. Okay? So that's going to be restricting them from sending money out into our economy. Okay? Same thing with the reserve requirement. Right? If we require them to, do, to have more on reserve, they have less in disposable money to send out and to allow people to take out loans for. Right? So you're going to have less investment. And therefore, you're going to have less money in the economy, right? So that's how we pull the money back in. So, Logan? Yeah. We're in a time of inflation. Okay. There's too much money in the economy. Yeah. You're going to buy bonds or you're going to sell them? Okay. Buy bonds. What happens if you buy a bond? Then it comes back. No. If you buy a bond, you get the bond, what happens to the money? It goes into the economy. So do you want that in a time of inflation? No. So what are you going to actually do with bonds? Good, right? So Sorry. you're selling a bond okay. and you're getting money, right? So the federal government's like, good, give me your money. Okay. okay. So when you read reports about what the Federal Reserve is doing, these are the things that they will use to try and control how much money is in the overall economy. So, yes. I see. Oh, I thought a question. Yes. So where does the federal government buy their bonds from? Because the federal government sells bonds, but the federal government is also trying to buy them. Yeah, so, okay, so consider this. So like I said, most of the bonds are 10 years. There are some really long ones. So there's like a 20-year bond, there's like a 25-year bond. Okay, so you're talking about like, 20, like okay. So there's like a bond in 1990 that was sold. Okay? But if it's a 25-year bond, when does it finish? Uh, 2000. Right, so that bond is still out there. So when the government buys bonds, they're buying bonds that could be issued from a long time ago. But the, the, the important thing is that they're buying the bonds. Right? So if they buy the bonds, then they send money out into the economy. Right? There's a bond market. Right? And if you look in like, the Financial Times and the New York Times and the finance section, you'll see like, the going rate for bonds. Because okay? there's a bond market, and that's where they buy the bonds. So they're buying back the bond they gave, gave like yes. five years ago. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so how does this affect the average American citizen with well, bonds? Well, you can actually buy government bonds, right? So like in times of war, uh, the government will issue like a war bond, and uh, essentially what it is is like, look, we need money to go fight these people. So I'll give you a bond, promising to pay you at some point in the future, and you give me the money, right? So then I can go buy planes and weapons to destroy people. Okay, so if you'll hear about war bonds. You'll hear about normal bonds. Like I said, local governments can issue bonds, right? So all of these people try and do these things uh, to get money to do other things with it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You sure? If it doesn't, let me know. Well, I'm, I'm like trying to see, like, the average American citizen, how could this, like, buying and selling of bonds directly benefit them? Okay. So, for example, if we have more money in the economy, and banks are able to do things, they have more money to do things with, correct? Mm -hmm. They can give you a loan at a lower interest rate because they have more money, right? They can loan it out. It's not as vital that they obtain, like, I don't know, 25% interest on it, right? That's a really high interest rate. Never take out a loan with 25% interest. <laughs> that's like those cash advance places. Don't go. <laughs> Seriously, that's what you're going to be back. Okay, so if banks can give you, can, like, say you want to buy a house, right? It's like Melanie's house. Okay? You'll have to probably buy a loan because chances are you probably don't have $100,000 just sitting in your pocket. And if you do, we need to talk after the lecture. <laughs> okay. So if you need to go to a bank, you want a lower interest rate, right? You want to pay back less in interest. Well, if the banks have more money to loan out, they can often give you a loan with a lower rate. Right? And by doing that, that's what the government's trying to do. They're trying to get banks to loan things out to people to put more money ultimately back in the economy. 
See what I'm saying? Yeah. And if, like, again, with a corporation, if a corporation went to a bank and said, we want to open a branch, but we can't really do it because we don't have the disposable income on hand, let's take out a loan with you, our bank, so that we can open a branch in Texas, right? Well, again, they need people to staff that branch. So they can hire more people, right? They can hire a security guard to make sure that the bank is that really stores are robbed. Um, they just have to do different things, correct? And if a branch opens, they can also sell their products, right? So that helps the average person because they can, you know, go to the store and buy products, right? So you'll see businesses opening all the time. That can be a function of some government policy, you know, that's way out in D.C., right? Mm -hmm. So you might not think that they have an impact, but the federal government's worked out they really do. Yes? Um, so with bonds, like, there, there's no way, like, after you buy a bond, you have to wait those 10 years. No, you, uh, you as a person <coughs> just can do what the government does. You can sell the bond. So, for example, if you bought it for $2,500 and you're like, it's a 10-year bond, and after five years, you're like, okay, I really like this interest, but I just don't want to wait for five years to get the rest of it back. You can sell it to another person, right? So there's a bond market, and you can sell it, okay? So like I said, you can buy government bonds, you can sell them, just like the government can. Okay. So in the time of recession, the government would decrease the <coughs> discount rate at the reserve requirement, and then the federal government would sell these bonds in order to make the money, oh, let's get the money out of the <coughs> Yes, they would buy the bonds in a recession. Um, yeah, because the bonds would then go into the Federal Reserve, and the money that paid for the bonds would go out in the economy. Okay. So that's what you do in a recession. You just flip it for times of inflation. Love it? Okay, sorry. Yeah, I don't know if you're getting No, it is, but yeah, it's fine. With the Federal Reserve, I know that, like, Jenny Ellen was made, like, chairman and stuff. Chairwoman. Chairwoman, sorry. Yes. <laughs> Who is in charge of the Federal Reserve? I mean, is it is it seen as... A complete branch of the government, or is it like seen as a bank, or how is it run? How it, it, okay, it is the U.S. central bank, okay. and it's an independent central bank. Okay. So the president appoints the chairperson okay. of the Federal Reserve. Okay, so oh, President Obama appointed Yellen yeah. when Bernanke's term was up. Yeah. Okay. There are also around the country, including one in Dallas, there are Federal Reserve banks. Okay. Right. So if you take out. It's kind of rare for a college kid to have money. But <laughs> if you take out an average thing, right, or if you take out a coin, you'll see the little Federal Reserve logo. Yes. Okay. Now, some of these will tell you which bank they were actually printed at, right? Oh. So all of these banks, these divisions of the Federal Reserve, operate around the country. Okay. And so they are each chaired by somebody. So when the Federal... So these open market operations are actually handled by... <clears throat> Surprisingly, the Federal Open Market Committee. Okay, so that committee, the FOMC, is actually what de or who determines uh, what all of these things will be. Okay. Right, so it's chaired by the chairman of the Federal Reserve, or chairwoman. Um, it also includes always the president of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Mm. We kind of want Wall Street knowing what's going on. <laughs> and then I think it is, what, five... Uh, it's like five of the presidents for the 11 or 12 uh, Federal Reserve banks from around the states. So they are the ones that make up their minds about what things should happen. Okay. So they, it's, it's independent because, again, we want it to be independent. We don't want our politicians being able to mess everything up. Right. Yeah. right? Let them mess up, mess up fiscal policy, but at least keep one thing sacred. Right. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's who ultimately makes the decisions. Okay. okay? Thank you. Uh, this is all a question. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so are you saying that like each of the Federal Reserve banks print their own money? Or is it, I thought it was just printed at like mints. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's mints, but what you'll see is if you look at like a coin, it'll say like Federal Reserve blah blah blah. So when it's printed, it's normally sent to those branches. Oh, okay. Okay, because again, the banks will have accounts with those, and so like again, a corporation in Texas is probably going to be doing most of their accounting, right? They're going to have most interaction with the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas. Right? They're not going to have as much with the Federal Reserve Bank in, like, I think there's one in Colorado. Right? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why they print that little thing on there. So just look at it. One day you'll notice it'll be like, oh, Dallas. And you'll be like, that's where, it, that's where it's been. Okay. Okay? Yeah. So the, the reason people buy bonds is because they get the amount they paid for plus... Plus interest. Buy. What are what Generally, what is the interest rate on Oh, uh, it depends. So for government bonds, it's going to be real low. Right? Because the assumption is the government's going to... It's going to pay you back, right? We've never defaulted on a government bond. That's why the possibility that we would default a couple of years back uh, was like, oh, we're going to 
this, right? Because we've never done it before. Uh, so we don't want to default, but because of that, it's going to be a real low interest rate, so, right? So the, the value that they, because the, it ends up being that the government is in debt to the people. Yeah, so right? yeah, so, so that's what a bond is, right? It's a debt interest. Say, say like they can afford to pay that interest back. Like oh yeah. The, it's not a. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, think think about all the money that the U.S. government takes in. Like they can afford to give out some interest, right? But if you if you look at uh, reports of the national debt, you'll see a, a specific part of that is payments due on interest, right? So all of the loans that the United States has, whether they be domestic bonds or whether they be like foreign countries we borrowed from, we have to pay a significant portion of interest, and that's what is like a mandatory part of our debt. And that's what's steadily been growing. <laughs> so if you I, take a look at it sometime, take a look at like the U.S. debt and look at like how it's composed, and you'll see interest payments, right? Because the government's like, we gotta pay the interest, right? We don't want to default. But for like corp, like uh, municipalities, so like Denton, the city of Denton wants to do something, right? Because they might default more easily, you're gonna obtain a higher interest rate on that bond, right? Because there's a greater chance that you're not gonna get your money back from Denton than there is a chance that you're not gonna get it back from like DC, right? You see what I'm saying? So as a result of that, when, when the corporate, when the municipality sells its bonds, they, they have to normally give it a higher interest rate. Right? Perfect. Just for the sake of business, yes. how would you define the defaulting? Okay, so defaulting is when you don't pay back. So either you don't pay the interest, or at the end when it comes to, what happens is so if these things are like 10 year, uh, the specific term is maturity, so at the end of 10 years, the bond has matured, and at that point, that's when you would get the principal, the $2,500 back, and so a default would be if you don't get that money back, and it's like, that was fun, uh, that was a cool 10-year experiment that just went wrong, okay, so that would be a default, yeah. So what's the danger to the U.S. right now of defaulting? Um, it's probably pretty low, right? The, the government knows that defaulting is something that's real bad, Right, because it, it just makes you look bad, first of all, right? Uh, and so when we were having all these debt problems, like we always kind of knew that we were going to pay it off, right? We were going to figure out some way to avoid defaulting. And even despite the partisanship, we probably will always do that because the reputation of the United States is far more important than political, uh, you know, polarization, right? So we're going to find a way to pay back our debt. Now the problem is we have so much of it that we're probably not ever going to pay it off, right? We're just going to consistently get more of it. And we'll pay it off gradually, and we'll pay it off as it comes due. But we're never going to like completely sell off our debt. It's just not going to happen, right? I would be like shocked. Hasn't that only happened like once? Didn't well, like when we were when we were real young, right, we yeah. didn't have fun debt, right? <laughs> it was very easy, right? Yeah. But even then, like we were we were taking out loans to yeah. like fight the British, right? But France helped us out. It's like the one time France has done something. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so that was important. So we were taking out loads, uh, you know, to be able to do things even back as far as 1776. Love it. This is a weird question. It's okay. okay. This is a weird lecture. Yeah. China and the United States are like, I mean, China's in pretty bad debt too, but because our economies are so intermingled. But why is both of us like defaulting on our debt? necessarily bad because we don't owe like money to the Martians. It's it's like all a global economy and we're like at the pinnacle. So Okay. So here, I, I, I understand here's, here's this the reputation thing. thing but yeah, well but that's that's crucial, that, right? Okay. Okay, because let's the US government is a lot, right? We spend a lot of money. Right. We do a lot of projects. Yes. If we found ourselves in a position where countries were like, we're not gonna finance that, we'd be in a okay. world of trouble. Okay. Right? Because our solution then would be to print more money. But that's not necessarily a good thing because then you'd have inflation, yeah. right? You'd have so much money in the economy. So we really need the reputation to be sound. And to do that, we have to avoid defaulting. Like, okay. it's just, you just don't do that. Okay. Like a big note in the car. <clears throat> I would say the government is not like an individual or a corporation. We can't file bankruptcy and restructure. <laughs> that would be a real nice idea. Yeah. We could just wipe all of our debt and start all over again. We might get it right the next time. <laughs> but unfortunately, and I would also ask you this, you, you say we're not going to be able to pay off the entire debt, but are we pretty much just paying interest? Yeah, 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 that's it. I mean, really, and, and that's, really all countries do that, right? So as long as you're paying off, you know, the interest that comes due, you're probably, I mean, at some point, you might get lucky. It depends, on, it depends on how much you're taking out, right? When the government borrows, it borrows millions and billions. Right, right. Sure. They just they don't have that floating around and be like, hey, let's just pay it back and be done with it, right? 
So they just pay off what they can, and so that's why, you'll, like I said, if you look at the, the uh, percentage of the debt, you'll see interest payments as a huge chunk of it, right? Because that's what we're concerned about paying. Yes? Okay, so with the U.S. national debt constantly increasing, is there ever going to be a point where we get to like such a point that like our our national debt exceeds like our GDP like crazy like it already like, does yeah, well, yeah I, I know, mean but like yeah. but like so much to the point that it's like we're like thirty trillion dollars in debt. Well, we're, we're already what halfway there. We're, we're seventeen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so, it's, so if yeah. we get to that point where it's like, is there a point that we'll have so much debt that we have to default? Probably not. I mean. Never. It, the case would be that the interest payment that's due on the debt would have to be greater than the GDP. And I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon, right? Because we're going to pay the interest. So if the interest is 100% of our GDP, that's going to be a problem because that means we can't do anything else yeah, except pay that interest. That right? But we're not at that point and we likely won't be at that point, right? Okay. We're a little bit better at managing our money than that. Okay. <laughs> at least for the short term. Yes. Okay, wait, but isn't having some debt helpful? Yes. So yeah. right. we have leverage over other countries. Well, yeah, okay, so so it's it's important, so it has leverage. It's also important because sometimes we want to do things now, and we can't do that now if we don't have the money now, right? So taking out debt is sometimes a good thing, right? It allows us to do projects now that we don't really want to put off for later. Okay, so that's a, a situation where it would be helpful. Yeah? If someone were to buy a bond and pass away, where does the money go? Is it stayed in the uh, Well, it's considered an asset, so it would probably depend on like how that person's will and testament was organized. Okay. Um, because it would be an asset, it would probably pass on to, like if, if they had like a benefactor or something, or the child. Okay. It's just considered an asset, so it would be. Like for example, I found a bond once that like my grandmother purchased, and I was like, hey, I could probably redeem this. But I was like, eh, it's, <laughs> she didn't do it, why, why should I? You know what I mean? <laughs> like somebody, somebody got some benefit out of having a bond. All right, real quick, and then we gotta move on. So if you're in a Congress round, would it be okay to possibly say that being, in, okay, we're, having as much debt as that, but being in debt is not inherently evil. Yeah, you could say that, look, all debt is not problematic. Right, okay. what, what is problematic is the degree of debt, I, okay. right? And so that's why I was talking to John. If it got to a point where we were, where our interest, the interest that we owed was like 100% of our GDP, that would be problematic, right? Because it would be a situation where it would be like, can we borrow our debt to pay back the interest on the other debt <laughs> so that we can now be indebted to you, but we cannot be indebted to this part, right? So that's not going to happen, right? But interest is a significant portion of our debt. Uh, so just realize that. But yes, you can, you can mention it in rounds. But again, realize that you're not going to get much offense by saying the U.S. is in debt, so we shouldn't do this. Okay. We've been in debt for a long time, right, yeah. and we've still managed to do things. And, and it's not as disastrous as partisans make it out to be. Like the U.S. debt yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, so okay. So again, there's it's been still talk. Bad, but anyway. There's been talk about doing a constitutional amendment to balance our budgets, right? I would not be in favor of that because there are cases where we want to run a deficit. Right? In cases of recession, I really would like the government to be spending a little bit more money so we can kind of jumpstart the economy. Uh, yeah. okay? So if we have to balance our budget and are forced to not be able to do that, that might be more problematic mm -hmm. than the debt that we're going to incur doing so. I gotcha. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So people will say, oh, the debt is such a bad thing. Well, okay, it, again, it depends on the degree of debt. Uh, but in general, it's not so problematic that it's like going to stifle anything else the government wants to do. Okay, real fast, because I know, I'm sure... Well, I know we need to move on, and I'm sure our recorder is tired of hearing making honest. Uh, so, but real fast, let's talk about uh, like global perspectives. So, there's two things I want to talk about. Okay, first, our externalities. Yeah, there are two types: the positive and the negative. Okay, an externality. What? What's this? What's this word? External. External, Out, right? Outside. Okay. So, Melly, you and Logan are doing something. You're neighbors. Have you seen the movie Neighbors? Yes. Okay. Perfect example of a negative <laughs> external. Okay. So, Zach Efron and his frat boys were like doing stuff, right? But what happened to the couple? Were they liking them, the noise that was coming from the house? No. No. Okay. That's a negative externality, right? It's not somebody who's involved in a particular activity or a transaction, but it's someone who's affected by it. Okay? Clearly, uh, who, who was it? Who was, the, was it Seth Rogen? Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen and... Uh, Roseburg. Rose yeah. I, uh, anyway, that's a negative externality, right? They were affected by it, even though they themselves weren't the ones going, party! Okay? 
Negative externality. Positive externalities are like, look, you ever driven in a neighborhood and you're like, look at all these lawns, they're really pretty, <laughs> right? They're really well kept, it's very nice. That's a positive externality, right? Okay. If you live in that neighborhood and everybody around you mows their yard, your house looks better, okay? It looks like you live in a better neighborhood. That's a positive externality. So when you talk about things in Congress, you can say, look, this policy is going to lead to negative problems. These negative problems are going to affect, like when we were talking yesterday about like the Indian Pakistan thing. And you guys were saying, look, this could affect another country. That in and of itself is a negative externality, okay? Mel? Um, for point of clarification, yes. so the negative one is you're not directly involved in the process, but you're being affected negatively, and then... Those are all externalities, right? It's yeah. somebody not involved in the process. Okay. Okay, so like, I am not going to personally mow my neighbor's lawn, <laughs> and I'm just not going to do it, you know, unless they're like, you know, hurting or they're injured or something, right? But I'm not going to, in normal times, do it, but I'm still affected by it, right? It still has some kind of impact, whether it's negative or positive, on me. Okay. Right, so that's what I mean by not involved in the transaction. Okay. Okay, and the last thing I want to talk about is uh, the concept of specialization and what you guys have already mentioned, which is inter interdependence. Right. So, in economics, we like to specialize in things that we're good at. Right. If we have two countries, Loganville. I love it. <laughs> Let's move there. In the <laughs> land. <laughs> Ia, there war. we go. Typically, war. Yeah, okay. okay, so if we have these two countries, right, <laughs> and Loganville can produce, I don't know, uh, what do you want to produce, Loganville? Skills. Skills. <laughs> okay, so Loganville can produce skills at $100 a pack. That was some expensive skill. You're going to be really tasting the rainbow. <laughs> All right. But Tippetlandia can, like, look, Tippetlandia's got a lot more factories. It can purchase them for, like, 10 cents. Okay. War. Who do you think is going to be producing the skills? <laughs> Timberland, right? Because they're like, hey, we're going to make a lot of these packs. We can also sell it, and we can make a lot more money, right? Because it costs so much for this Loganville to make it, they're not going to sell it. So this is what we mean when we talk about specialization, right? So comparatively, the countries are going to engage and produce or manufacture what they can do for a lower price. But because countries have specialized, it leads to a situation of interdependence, right? Because a given country, say in this case Loganville, is not producing everything available in the market, but they're relying upon Tippetlandia for their Skittles, they're interdependent, right? They have to rely on the fact that Tippetville is going to constantly produce Skittles. Because if they don't, and the people are like, we need Skittles, <laughs> then what are you going to do, right? You don't have any research because you're not producing Skittles, okay? So international trade leads to situations of interdependence. So when you're talking about resolutions dealing with relations and trade, realize that trade and specialization go hand in hand, right? Because we've specialized, we often engage in more international trade with other countries, right? Because we want those products, products that aren't necessarily produced in the United States, for example, and because of that, we have to rely on those other countries. Okay? So you can use that into a round and say, look, you know, if we're going to harm trade, what we could end up doing is harming our economic relationships and, as a result, our economy. Okay? So like I said at the beginning, everything in the economy is interrelated. It doesn't matter if it's just the U.S. economy or if it's the world economy. All right? These are common terms that you need to know. You, like I said before, you may not actually need them ever around, but I want you to know them because if somebody like says GDP, I don't want you to be like, uh, yes, GDP, <laughs> very important concept. Okay, so I want you guys to know the basics of them. You don't have to know the intricacies. You don't have to know all the math that goes into computing these things. You're never going to have to do that, right? Unless you're as stupid as I was and you major in economics. Hey. Okay, so. Don't worry about it. What you need to do is have a ground knowledge of all of these things. And if you are, like I said, if you're confused about any of this, ask me questions later or send me an email, right? Like, I'm always available. So, thanks for paying attention. Uh, take, let's take like a five minute break. Uh, we'll come back. And thanks to our reporter for sitting in on economics. I'm sure it was engaging. Uh, so go break, get up, stretch. Please get up and stretch. I know economics is not the most exciting. This is fun. Go stretch. The council